Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, welcome to Imbiasi's webinar lecture series 2022. Uh, I am Sarah Hani Harun, your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, the video we played just now captures the GIST background of our institute, the Institute of Systems Biology in Biasi's, located in University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Bangi, Selangor. I hope it has given you sufficient insight into the institute. So, those who are interested in collaborating with us, you are most welcome to do so. Also, feel free to browse the EMBIC's website and social media for the latest updates and info. I feel so grateful today that all of us are granted good health and time to attend our webinar. So far, this is our 12th webinar for this year. There will be many more webinars to come, and I hope all of you will join us again in the future. Today's honourable speaker is our research fellow, Dr. Noazla No Muhammad. Before we start, let me share Dr. Noazla's CV with you. Okay, uh, TS Dr. Noor Azlan is currently the Head of Centre for Bioinformatics Research, CBR, at Invisys UKM. His expertise is in bioinformatics and com computational systems biology. His research focuses on applying bioinformatics to omics data to unravel new genes and pathways for the development of precision biotechnology. He applies genomics, transcriptomics, metagenomics, and metatranscriptomics technologies based on short and long reads next generation sequencing platforms. Uh, these workflows are combined with sequence analysis, domain characterization, phylogenetics, pathway reconstruction, and database development to unravel new knowledge from the big biological data. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Noor Azlan to share his experience with us. Uh, Dr. Noor Azlan, the screen is yours. Thank you, Dr. Sarani, for the warm welcome. welcome. Um, so, uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, so, let me first share my slides. <clears throat> Um, does that look okay? Okay. But you didn't full screen yet, right? Okay, all right. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so, uh, for today's uh, webinar, uh, uh, I'll be focusing on, um, explaining or sharing with you guys, uh, how, uh, bioinformatics, uh, plays a role, uh, especially in systems biology um, at uh, our institute uh, in biosis. So for today's talk, um, I will um, have three sections uh, to today's webinar. Uh, first is uh, what is bioinformatics and systems biology. Uh, then I will give uh, some of the problems uh, that uh, me and my colleagues are working on. Uh, as well as example projects uh, where we apply uh, bioinformatic techniques uh, and data analysis in order to accelerate um, development of uh, precision biotechnology. Okay, what is uh, bioinformatics and systems biology? Um, Bioinformatics, uh, th th there are many um, definitions uh, to the field of bioinformatics, uh, but I like uh, this definition uh, the most. Uh, it's basically uh, data science, uh, but with the domain knowledge uh, in biology. Um, so we apply uh, data science techniques, mostly uh, algorithms, uh, processing of large data sets, statistics, uh, computer science techniques, uh, where we uh, split problems into small um, um, computable uh, problems uh, in order to process uh, this large, this large uh, amount of biological data. <clears throat> so me myself, uh, I have a training uh, in software engineering, uh, 
mechanical engineering and and so on uh, in order to develop uh, the skills needed uh, to be a bioinformatician. Um, so one of the key uh, skills uh, that is needed uh, by a bioinformatician uh, is called computational thinking. Um, so this is related to the ability to think recursively using abstraction and decomposition when completing complex tasks. Um, so uh, things that we decompose, for example, um, um, uh, NGS, uh, next generation sequencing data that are um, gigabytes in size. Um, so we, um, for example, uh, in assembly uh, techniques, uh, we do normalization and so on in order to reduce the data set uh, just to be able to complete it. Um, we also develop algorithms. Um, so in bioinformatics, uh, method development or pipeline development plays an important role. Uh, so you need to be able uh, to think like a computer, basically. Uh, computers are, they are fast, they are very quick uh, in calculating um, and getting results, uh, but, that, but they are not clever. So you have to give instructions uh, step by step. Uh, in order for them uh, to process the large amount of data and to find uh, something meaningful uh, from the data that we have. So here is an example uh, of uh, our codes that we have developed. Um, so in the box there, uh, basically we transfer um, entities uh, such as proteins, uh, gene ontologies, domains, pathways and so on uh, in biology. Uh, but we apply them uh, in this is an example uh, PHP code uh, where we categorize uh, the data sets uh, that we get from functional annotation uh, analysis uh, in order to uh, display um, the results uh, for easier um, searching and browsing by the users uh, of our database. Um, so here <coughs> Uh, basically, each uh, entity is being contained uh, in a, what we call a class. Um, so based on that, uh, we can apply uh, different different um, computational uh, processes. Uh, for example, uh, here we just count uh, how many entries are there, how many proteins are in the database, how many gene ontologies and so on. Uh, on the right uh, is basically is our search function. Um, so uh, depending on uh, what the user selects, uh, we need to combine uh, either use or or and end functions uh, in order uh, to select uh, the correct results. So what is systems biology then? Um, so systems biology um, uh, basically is a systems overview. Um, so a system uh, is an engineering term. Uh, where we uh, see the problem uh, in a big picture uh, and area view. So in terms of biology, uh, so it basically means the study of interaction of components of a biological system and how these interactions give rise uh, to the functions of the system. Uh, so here is uh, an example network um, that consists of genes, uh, reactions and metabolites. Uh, so each um, uh, nodes uh, are color coded uh, to each of the types, and um, the 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 blue the blue links are basically the reactions uh, that goes between the uh, different genes and metabolites. Um, so uh, <clears throat> these are being uh, visualized uh, just to show the complexity uh, that is uh, being uh, present in, in biological systems. Um, Next, I want to highlight uh, just the amount of public biological data. Um, so those who have done um, systems biology projects, uh, uh, including uh, genomics, transcriptomics, uh, proteomics, and so on, I know that uh, one of the uh, databases that, that we <clears throat> uh, refer to uh, is the NCBI database. Um, so here shows the growth uh, of the NCBI database uh, for the past uh, 30 years. Uh, so at the moment, um, in terms of sequences, uh, there, are almost, uh, there are more than 200 million sequences. Uh, and here we can also see the different, different types of uh, smaller databases that are present in the NCBI. Um, so it started with the GenBank, 
then we have the PubMed for publications. Uh, we have the PubChem for um, um, uh, molecular structures uh, and so on. Um, <clears throat> here we also see the number of uh, users uh, weekday. Um, so at the moment, um, in late 2019, uh, there are more than 6 million users uh, uh, during the working days. Uh, so it's a large resources that are being used very extensively. Uh, we also have uh, other databases. Uh, they are species specific. Uh, for example, the MIS, uh, GDB, the Soybase and Lego Information Systems. Uh, so these uh, do also have uh, thousands of users uh, every month. Uh, Apart from sequence databases, uh, we also have um, other databases such as Uniprot, which is a protein uh, sequence database. We have uh, PFAM here, uh, which is a protein family database, uh, PDB, protein structure database, uh, as a, a cap. So um, <clears throat> here we see uh, the amount of uh, publicly uh, available datasets. Uh, they are freely to be downloaded uh, and to be uh, work on uh, by anyone uh, who are interested. So why uh, the growth of, of these uh, data sets? Uh, mainly is driven by the cost of uh, doing um, sequencing. Um, so here we can see that um, in the early 2000s, uh, it cost over $10,000 uh, per raw megabase uh, of DNA sequence. And nowadays, uh, it's less than 10 cents uh, US dollars. Um, so in terms of uh, ringgit, uh, I can say it's around one or 2,000 ringgit per sample nowadays uh, if we are using the Illumina platform. Um, so just uh, the reduction of the cost uh, pushes uh, this growth of uh, publicly available uh, data sets. Uh, next, I want to highlight in terms of uh, protein structures. Um, so one of the um, um, breakthrough, I would say, uh, in um, structural bioinformatics is the development of uh, AlphaFold uh, by the company DeepMind, uh, a company of Alphabet uh, and Google. Uh, so they collaborated with Amber EBI, uh, a UK um, research uh, center that um, prioritizes bioinformatics and uh, they just released uh, 200 million uh, protein structures. Um, so that can be accessed uh, by anyone uh, in the AlphaFold uh, database. Um, so this is being um, uh, obtained uh, through machine learning and high performance computing. Um, so uh, they, Google used their big data centers uh, to produce the structures uh, of the sequences that they gather from uh, publicly available information uh, that I mentioned just now. Um, so here we see another set of uh, data set. So apart from uh, sequencing technologies, uh, proteomics technologies, metabolic technologies uh, that depend on uh, expensive machines uh, in order to generate data, we also have uh, computationally generated data. Uh, so these uh, data being generated uh, by analysis, uh, by computing. Um, so on the right there are some of just uh, the example structures uh, that are being uh, uploaded into the AlphaFold database. Um, there are also a wealth of uh, open source tools uh, in uh, the field of bioinformatics. Uh, here I just want to highlight uh, an example. Um, so one of the repository or package manager that we as bioinformaticians use uh, is Bioconda. Um, so it's, uh, Anyone who's uh, familiar with uh, data science tools uh, should be familiar with Anaconda. So Bioconda is a bioinformatics uh, version or, or, or um, blueprint uh, for Anaconda. So here, just in Bioconda alone, uh, there are uh, at the moment, uh, so this is very recent, uh, this week, uh, we have uh, over 9,000 bioinformatics tools that are freely available to be downloaded uh, and used uh, by anyone. Um, so these tools are the tools that are being um, used by uh, various publications. Uh, so it's open source. So the nice thing about open source is it's not only free, but you can also download uh, the source code of the tools and make your own version of it. 
Um, so you can modify and upload back. Uh, let's say you have a, a assembler just for fungus uh, genome, uh, fungal genomes, or for example, or you have a assembler that's uh, only uh, very very uh, good at uh, assembling long reads, uh, for example. So you can make your own version of the tools and re-upload it uh, as open source as well, uh, so that other people can uh, benefit from it. Um, so since it's open source, uh, it's being supported by research groups, uh, meaning that um, even researchers who uses these tools uh, often uh, uh, send um, comments or, or report uh, the bugs and they are present in these tools uh, for the developer to uh, improve the tools. Uh, uh, on the bottom there, we can see um, uh, total downloads over 6 million uh, just from uh, Bioconda alone. Uh, and on the left there, uh, the different different um, um, programming languages uh, that are being implemented by these tools. Uh, so most of them are bioconductor or R-based uh, programs uh, and also a big chunk is uh, in Python. Um, another um, enabler for bioinformatics nowadays uh, is also that uh, computers are getting way, way faster. Um, so, just an example here, uh, a, a CPU here, a central processing unit, um, so the, 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 the brains of our computers, uh, the performance in 2019 versus 2011 um, gets more than double, uh, so the, the performance doubled uh, in 8 years. Uh, but uh, 2022 to 2019, uh, two years, uh, a bit above two years, uh, there are already another two-fold increase in performance. Um, so um, during uh, my bachelor's degree, during my uh, PhD studies, uh, bioinformatics are only being able to be done uh, for people who have access to high-performance computers or supercomputers. Uh, but nowadays, uh, since the competing hardware, the computers are getting very uh, fast. Uh, even uh, the ones that uh, we use uh, every day, our laptops, our handphones, and so on, uh, they are very quick. Uh, so uh, it enables um, more people to do bioinformatics. Uh, so with the data set, with the open source tools, uh, with our computers are being able to uh, process uh, this biological data, um, I feel that uh, now is a good time uh, for anyone who haven't chosen their career path yet uh, to do bioinformatics. Um, so what's, uh, what we as bioinformaticians uh, face every day? Um, so here are uh, 10 simple rules for getting started with command line bioinformatics. So since uh, the nature of uh, bioinformatic tools is open source, so most of the tools are command line, uh, meaning that uh, you have to type uh, in a terminal uh, instead of using a mouse, uh, like you uh, interface with a word, Excel, and so on. Um, the main reason is just because the um, soft, the tools are open source, they are free, uh, no, no one's paying the developer to build the tools. Uh, so they tend to not uh, build the graphical user interface uh, for the tools. Uh, so they are also uh, commercially available bioinformatic tools, uh, but they are, to me, is very expensive uh, and are usually used by uh, large uh, industrial organizations such as pharmaceutical companies um, or the big big uh, biotech companies. Um, so we in the uh, university uh, usually uh, only have access uh, to these command line uh, tools. Um, so this is uh, is a yes or no type of thing. Uh, so you either like it or you don't like it. Um, so uh, as uh, uh, for our students, for example, we have uh, some who are really into it. Um, so they like uh, tinkering uh, with the command line tools, uh, try try um, different different things, trying different different commands, uh, trying different data sets. Uh, but some just um, Every time there's an error, uh, they, they give up. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's a thing whether you like it or, or not like it. Uh, so um, I'm um, one of the ones who like it. Uh, so I like to tinker with uh, programs. Uh, uh, 
doing algorithms, uh, custom scripts, and so on. Um, so this uh, is very um, natural to me, basically. Um, so as a bioinformatician, um, so compared to people who do wet lab experiments and so on, they troubleshoot their, their, their assays or their extractions and so on. Uh, we usually troubleshoot our uh, analysis. Um, so here are just uh, examples, uh, screenshots that I got from the internet regarding um, what kind of uh, errors uh, that are faced uh, by people who try to run these uh, bioinformatic tools. Uh, so uh, most of them are usually simple errors. Uh, so either your file is not formatted correctly, uh, then uh, there are errors in uh, typing the commands itself because since you need to type uh, this uh, long, long um, um, text uh, that, that are not English, uh, they are programming, uh, pro uh, programmatic language. Um, so uh, it's very uh, fussy as well. So um, if the command uh, only accepts uh, small letters, you need to type in small letters. You need to be aware of the dots, of the spaces, and so on. Uh, and um, so it takes time. Uh, it takes time to be comfortable with uh, these things. All right. Um, so that's a brief uh, information of uh, what is bioinformatics and uh, what we do as uh, bioinformaticians in the field of systems biology. And next, I want to um, highlight uh, one of the problems uh, that uh, me and my colleagues are working on. Um, so um, these are just uh, one of the various projects that I'm involved in. Um, so uh, it's related uh, to oil pump diseases and tests. So the oil pump industry uh, is the biggest contributor to Malaysia's agriculture GDP. Um, so over 37% uh, for the agriculture section of the GDP. Um, so our GDP uh, mostly uh, uh, is obtained from the services um, industry, uh, but uh, agriculture in, in agriculture section, um, oil pump is the biggest one. Uh, so in terms of uh, production, we exported more than 70 million metric tons of palm oil worth over 17 billion uh, in um, 20, 2020 and 2021. Uh, we are also the second biggest producer of the world's palm oil. Uh, the biggest producer is Indonesia at the moment. Um, so, but uh, Indonesia and Malaysia basically uh, 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 is the monopoly in, in, this, in this industry. Um, so palm oil is being used uh, as uh, uh, ingredients uh, for many things, uh, such as our food, our bakeries, uh, our snacks, um, our um, frying oil, um, our soap, uh, and so on. Uh, so there are many um, products uh, that depends uh, on this uh, oil palm. Um, so what are the problems uh, being faced uh, by the oil palm industry? Um, so uh, here I just want to highlight uh, two uh, different problems. Uh, one is diseases. Um, so one of the disease uh, that affects the oil palm tree is basal stem rot uh, caused by the fungus Gardenoma bolinense. Uh, and there's also um, insect pests. Um, so on the top there, bedworms, uh, there are two different species there. Uh, there's nettle caterpillars and uh, also rhinoceros beetle. So this either eats uh, the leaves of the tree uh, or also the or, or the barks of the tree. Um, so um, the damage uh, being, uh, being caused uh, by these insects uh, causes a reduction in the Oil pump being uh, uh, the oil being produced by the trees. Um, so I highlighted translational uh, biotechnology uh, in my title. Um, so in terms of uh, the one I'm working on, uh, I'm closely related in IPM or Integrated Pest Management. Um, so uh, this is a, a holistic uh, way of uh, trying to control insect pests. Uh, so either through pest control, uh, through the um, spraying of uh, insecticides uh, to kill the pests, 
or either through uh, pest prevention, uh, meaning that uh, they usually uh, in the industry, they control and uh, they, they, they are aware in terms of the numbers of the pests uh, that are present in the fields. So they control the, num the number before it gets uh, uh, to uh, uh, an outbreak uh, and so on. Uh, there's also the field of pest identification. Uh, so uh, some of the beetles, for example, uh, they borrow through the, the bark of the tree uh, and cannot be seen. Uh, so usually um, people can only detect whether the trees are being eaten by these beetles uh, once the hole gets too big and, and that's already too late. Um, so how um, we can, uh, as a bioinformatician, uh, using this uh, wealth of uh, information that are available in the databases, uh, as well as the omics technologies that we have access to, uh, how we can accelerate um, this uh, transitional biotechnology. So um, the first uh, one is basically biological data mining. Uh, so uh, in the thousands of genes uh, that we obtain from the transcriptomics data, for example, or from genomics data, for example, um, which are the genes uh, that should we focus on, uh, that we should we study more. Um, there's also the processing of omics data. Um, so nowadays, um, um, as a bioinformatician, we, know, we need to know the best way or the most efficient way of, uh, and of processing this omics data. Uh, so uh, I have experience where some students uh, takes a few months just to do something that should only takes a few days uh, just because uh, the student doesn't know what kind of tools that are suitable uh, for the analysis that needs to be done. Um, we also try to help in knowledge discovery, uh, for example, looking or identifying new pathways uh, that are present in the species that we obtain the omics data from. Um, we also try to, to do predictions. Um, so uh, before uh, we can do functional characterization or functional uh, analysis in um, wet lab experiments, uh, usually we try to do computational prediction first, uh, just to reduce the number of tests that needs to be done or, or, or things that need to be validated. Uh, because um, chemicals um, services are expensive uh, compared to uh, computational analysis. And lastly, uh, the visualization of this uh, mass amount of biological data. Uh, so on the right there is just some of the um, example uh, visualizations that we do in bioinformatics. Um, on the right, uh, in terms of the uh, metagenomics uh, analysis, uh, where we can see the distribution of the reads uh, based on the different different uh, classes uh, in the taxonomy, uh, bacterial taxonomy. Uh, on the bottom there is quite small, but that uh, basically uh, is a taxonomic classification as well. And on the top there is just uh, the bin, uh, the beginning part of doing uh, metagenomics analysis. Um, all right, um, so from the oil palm industry, um, I want to give uh, two example projects uh, that I'm working on closely. Uh, the first one is the problem of uh, the fungus uh, Galenoma bolinense, uh, the fungus that causes the basal stem rot. Um, so one of the things that uh, our student uh, Ebasis did is uh, trying to figure out, uh, to annotate uh, effectors in, in Galenoma uh, bolinense. Um, so why? Uh, because effectors, uh, the the secretory proteins that alter host cells to suppress host defense mechanisms and facilitate infection by the pathogen so it can derive nutrients from the host. Uh, so once the, uh, fun the, the fungus uh, gets attached uh, towards the tree, uh, they excrete these proteins uh, in order um, to weaken uh, the host defense by the oil palm tree uh, for, for it to, to be there to, to survive uh, on the surface of the, uh, the bark of the tree. Um, so in previous work, um, there are two uh, effectors that have been uh, published. Uh, first is the NRP or non-ribosomal peptide, uh, as well as the NEP1 uh, protein. Uh, but uh, what happens to the rest of the, the, the genes? Are, are there uh, not uh, any other um, 
effectors in uh, granular marble DNA assay. Um, so we, uh, when we started the project, um, two available genomes are available, uh, the G3 and the NJ3 strains. So these are different, different strains of granular marble DNA assay uh, from uh, samples in uh, the, uh, Sumatra. Um, so in terms of uh, the strain in Malaysia, uh, there's no uh, genome data available yet. Uh, so uh, we uh, basically sequence uh, the T10 strain, uh, which is said uh, to be a highly virulent um, species uh, or strain uh, of the Ganyama Bodenese here in Malaysia. Um, so from the uh, assembled um, genome, uh, we try to identify the candidate effector proteins or uh, short form as CEPs um, using uh, bioinformatic pipelines that we develop. Um, so on the right there are the three genomes. Um, then we have also PER71, which is a transcriptomics uh, data set. Um, so uh, the transcriptomics data set is basically a feeder to the Breaker2 pipeline. Uh, so Breaker2 does gene prediction. Uh, so from the genome uh, that we obtained um, two years ago, uh, when we started the project, um, the code CDS, the coding sequence, uh, have not been annotated yet. Uh, so that's why we need to build the gene model uh, in using Breaker2 uh, from the transcriptomic data. Then basically we predict uh, all the genes uh, from the three strains. Um, so from that, uh, we get the protein sequences uh, and run through uh, this uh, pipeline with, that we have developed. Uh, so the first one is uh, to figure out uh, whether they are uh, secreted proteins, um, then we use a set of uh, effector P uh, prediction tools. Uh, so these are said uh, being claimed by the developers to be able to uh, predict um, effector proteins. Um, so why all three tools were used? Uh, basically, the algorithms between the three different tools are different. Uh, I think the latest one, effector P, uses machine learning, uh, and the first two they um, they they use a rule base or, or uh, something along the lines. So that's uh, why we uh, selected to use uh, all three um, uh, versions of the tool. We also uh, annotate the functions of the proteins that we have uh, from the Breaker2 pipeline uh, using various databases. Uh, um, the most uh, related or, or, or for CEPs uh, is Firebase and uh, K Kzyme, uh, KZ database. Um, so uh, using the pan genome approach, uh, pan genome approach is basically the study of um, uh, many strains of uh, yeah, of uh, the same um, species. Um, so here we found uh, different numbers of uh, secreted proteins. Um, so basically, there's variation uh, between uh, the, the the prediction of uh, the proteins being secreted by these three strains. Um, so we also classified them uh, is, uh, into autologous groups. Uh, so autologous are homologous genes where a gene diverges after a speciation event, but the gene and its main function are conserved. Um, so basically, we can treat uh, each uh, groups as a, a a big gene, uh, a gene uh, that does the same function. Um, so we generated that data, uh, and uh, basically, uh, this is the, um, the 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 annotation that we did. Uh, over three thousand autologous groups, uh, and being here, they are separated into um, what we call as a core. Um, effector proteins, uh, so 937 uh, core proteins that are present in all the three strains. Uh, we also have uh, accessory uh, effector proteins, uh, so it's only present in two of the strains, uh, as well as species-specific um, effector proteins. Um, so from that, we also annotated uh, against uh, the KZ, uh, Carbohydrate Active Enzyme Database. Um, 
So the KZ database describes the families of structurally related catalytic and carbohydrate binding module, mod, modules of enzymes that degrade, modify, or create glycosylic bonds. Um, and we also overlap that uh, with the five bases, uh, which is the pathogen host infection database, um, in order to um, uh, sort or, or in order to uh, as a filter uh, which are the most probable uh, candidate effector proteins. Um, <clears throat> so most of them are classified as uh, carboxy carboxylesterases or lipases. Uh, and these enzymes uh, have been reported to be involved in suppressing plant immunity. Uh, so we were in the right uh, direction. Um, so the details of this work uh, have been published uh, recently. Um, so for those who are interested in uh, seeing the detailed pipeline, uh, can refer to our publication. All right. Next, I want to go into the example of uh, our Metisa Plana work. Um, so Metisa plana is one of the bedworms uh, that eats the leaves uh, of the oil palm tree. Uh, so once the leaves uh, get damages, uh, have holes in them and so on, um, the trees are uh, being stressed and so on. Uh, so the oil palm, uh, oil uh, production uh, gets uh, lowered significantly. Um, so the bedworm uh, have different, different stages in their life cycle. Uh, and uh, it's quite a short life cycle, uh, around um, three months. Uh, so from the egg, uh, then they are the most damaging uh, during the uh, larva stages, uh, especially in the second and third insta larva. So this uh, during the time they eat the leaves uh, very uh, aggressively. Um, so once uh, they have eaten uh, enough, they are got, uh, big enough, uh, they become pupa and lastly into adults. Um, so one of the um, challenges uh, being faced by the oil palm industry players uh, is the, when applying the insecticides uh, that targets uh, bedworm, um, the, um, the, the, the rate of uh, affected uh, is different between the different, different stages, uh, meaning that um, they need to apply uh, the insecticides uh, quite often uh, because uh, at any one time, uh, the different, different stages are present at the same time. Um, so uh, there is a need of uh, developing a more efficient um, insecticides uh, uh, an ideal insecticide would be able to target all the stages, meaning that either they are in the pupa stage, the adult stage, they are also affected. Um, so in the pupa stage, uh, they have a casing around them. Um, so uh, that's the main challenge, uh, as well as uh, during the adults, um, that it, it flies around and so on. So um, there are different, different um, uh, effectiveness uh, being shown uh, from the current uh, ways of controlling uh, this bedworm. Um, so from the different uh, stages, uh, we extracted the RNA um, sample and uh, did uh, RNA sequencing. Um, so we uh, did uh, nine samples uh, using the Illumina platform. Uh, and we applied uh, the Trinity pipeline uh, in order to get um, the transcripts uh, as well as the differentially expressed uh, genes being present uh, between the uh, each of the two stages being compared uh, at any moment. Um, so from that, um, we have uh, our published uh, paper um, published uh, almost 200,000 transcripts. Uh, so this is have been cut down. Uh, so our initial assembly is actually more like uh, 800,000 transcripts, but just due to the uh, large number of transcripts, uh, we, 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 we applied a filter just to get uh, a more uh, manageable number of transcripts uh, to process. Um, so from that, uh, we did um, annotation uh, against uh, databases, uh, First is uh, SwissPro and a non-redundant sequence database. 
Campbell uh, Gene Ontology Database uh, and lastly the CAC uh, Pathway Database. So here we can see that um, only a small portion of the um, uh, sequences or transcripts uh, have been annotated. So uh, this is a field where uh, I'm very uh, interested in exploring uh, because how, how can we uh, improve this? Uh, so these are basically hypothetical proteins, right? And the sequences are there, but they cannot be assigned a function. Um, so uh, this is uh, another field uh, where, where, where we should go into uh, how to increase uh, the annotation of uh, trans, um, transcripts that we obtain from a uh, sequencing uh, pipelines. Um, here are the um, results for the differential expression. Um, so we compare uh, two stages at a time. Uh, first is egg versus larva. Um, so the number of um, differential expression genes uh, um, uh, in the thousands. Um, so, uh, but this uh, th there are no genome yet. Um, so some uh, genes might be. Um, uh, duplicate and so these are based on, on transcripts uh, the number of transcripts uh, being uh, up or down regulated um, and we can see that the trend goes down um, we are not sure why yet uh, maybe uh, just uh, either the um, transcripts belong to the same gene or, or not uh, we are not sure yet uh, but here what, what we see so far um, so one of the pathways uh, that we manage uh, to uh, identify uh, from the RNA sequencing data is the chitin biosynthesis pathway. Uh, so um, uh, we apply basically gene mining uh, where we um, um, select um, the sequences of each of the uh, enzymes uh, from uh, databases and um, search against our transcriptome data in order to get uh, a better um, heat ratio compared to the annotation being done by SysPro and NR. Um, so um, this is just one of the uh, pathways. Um, so there are many more uh, developmental pathways that we need to fish out uh, from this data set. Uh, and after that, uh, then only we can uh, really understand uh, how this backworm um, and develops uh, from the egg until the adult stage. Um, so this uh, has been published in 2020. Um, so uh, feel free to uh, browse through or read through our papers uh, if you want, uh, if you need more information regarding uh, that. Um, all right, um, so in um, that's uh, some of the examples, uh, just uh, the projects that I'm involved in. Um, so uh, next uh, is acknowledgement. So, uh, so this uh, work uh, being led by uh, the Matissa Planner work is being led by Dr. Maizu Masen. Um, so uh, also being uh, helped by our industry partners, uh, Cik Muhammad Rizwan and Dr. Suhaida Sulaiman from AGB. Uh, the Ganonoma work uh, being led by Dr. Bazi uh, and uh, the students, of course, uh, who did most of the hard work uh, analyzing data, sending for sequencing, uh, figuring out uh, the pipelines that needs to be used and so on. Um, so um, also our funders, uh, UKM, as well as the Ministry of Higher Education. Um, so what's next, right? Um, so the Ganonoma Bonese project, um, so we managed to uh, annotate some of the candidate factor proteins, uh, but uh, we might try uh, to figure out uh, how to apply machine learning model uh, to get uh, a better prediction. Um, so since the current tools are um, uh, being uh, trained on uh, different data sets, uh, so maybe a Ganonoma specific uh, sequences uh, we allow for a more accurate uh, machine learning model to be developed. Um, maybe uh, also uh, how to choose uh, which protein um, that we should target uh, for basal, um, the disease control and diagnosis. Uh, 
Um, so uh, either for treatment or, or, or just to prevent uh, the granuloma to be uh, infecting the trees in the first place. Uh, and maybe uh, PPI modeling between the granuloma boninense and all palm proteins. Uh, so uh, currently protein protein interaction works uh, between species are very hard to do uh, because uh, the current databases uh, only allows uh, for um, in, in inter inter species uh, PPI modeling. Uh, so here we might need to go into uh, maybe structure based uh, uh, structure based uh, to to get the PPI data. Uh, in terms of the Metisa plana, uh, so one of the big problems is, is the uh, just the number of uh, unannotated uh, uh, genes and proteins. Um, so here, machine learning might be uh, good as well. Uh, so maybe we can train uh, a machine learning model that uh, correlates uh, between the sequences uh, in the NR database, for example. Um, uh, then the identification of the remaining developmental pathways. Uh, so there were thousands of uh, up or down regulated genes, uh, but uh, at the moment, uh, in terms of the full pathway, uh, we only uh, have one. Uh, so the, the, the other pathways that are related, that are known to be related uh, to insect development, uh, so it's only partially filled. Um, so there are missing genes in, inside there. Um, and lastly, maybe the identification of targets for control. Uh, so this is specifically important for uh, biopesticide development. Um, so in order to uh, create new pesticides, we need to figure out first uh, what, what proteins or what genes that we want to target uh, inside uh, the species, the, the web own species. Okay. All right. Um, lastly, I just want to promote our um, CODA. Uh, being led by Dr. Sarani. Um, so uh, apart from research, uh, we also help uh, other people who wants to do uh, systems biology work, uh, either in trans transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, as well as bioinformatics, where uh, we process multi-omics data uh, uh, as a service. Um, so those who want uh, um, this as an option, uh, we, are, we also offer it. Um, so here are the different things that we might help you guys with. Uh, we can do analysis, we can do uh, structural bioinformatics, for example, uh, molecular dynamics. Uh, we can also figure out um, a process uh, RNA sequencing data. So if um, for those who, for example, uh, get your data from um, public um resources uh, so uh they are not, they're not uh, being processed uh, so we can discuss uh, on that uh, as well as um, we also have uh, proteomics and also metabolomics here at Inverisys. okay next week uh, next monday i want to promote uh, my workshop um so we have an online workshop for five days uh, monday to friday uh so uh, me and Dr. Noor Farhan uh, from UKM as well, uh, we will be uh, the trainers uh, for this uh, workshop. So this workshop is good for those who um, have zero um, background on bioinformatics. Uh, so we teach you step by step on how to choose which tools that you need uh, to analyze what kind of data, you know, where to get the data in the first place, uh, how to access the NCBI database, how to download all the raw reads, um, from sequencing projects done by other peoples and how to process them. Uh, and hopefully um, uh, this will guide you in order um, to design uh, your bioinformatics project um, that uh, you want to do. All right, um, that's all from me. Thank you. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Noor Aslan, for sharing a very interesting topic with us. As for the CODA service that we have here at Imbiasis, we welcome anyone who working on omics data to see us for any consultation on your project to produce publication-ready results in a very short time. 
Okay, uh, for anyone with questions regarding Dr. No Azlan's presentation just now, feel free to write down your questions in the chat box. Then I will read the questions for you. All right, okay, I can see there are several questions already been posted here. I will start off with Dr. Ghost's question. Any advice for biologists venturing into bioinformatics? Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Go. Um, so, um, throughout my um, interactions uh, with uh, uh, students as well as uh, other researchers uh, that have uh, no background in bioinformatics but try to do bioinformatics, um, the main hurdle is the expectation. Um, so, um, uh, the main hurdle is the expectation on the bioinformatic tools uh, and analysis. Uh, as I said, um, most of the tools that we uh, have access here in the academic area are command line based tools. Um, so um, they are um, easy to use bioinformatic tools. Uh, for example, one of uh, the one I can recommend uh, maybe T T Bio. Um, so it's a web based. Um, um, bioinformatics uh, platform basically uh, so you can do anything from uh, machine learning to uh, to genome assembly and so on uh, but you need to pay the subscription fee I'm not sure how much at the moment uh, but that's an option uh, if you really uh, don't want to have your uh, uh, to, to go through the, pro the problem of learning uh, programmatic or, or computational thinking uh, but to those other, uh, open your your uh, view. Uh, so first, uh, I would suggest uh, to learn uh, programming. Um, programmatic thinking. Uh, one of the easiest way to learn at the moment is using Scratch, basically. So for those, I'm not sure who. Uh, some 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 uh, our kids school. So they have these classes where they teach programming. Um, so they use Scratch. Um, so it's a software uh, that teaches uh, how to develop algorithms and so on, but it's not, uh, you, you don't type on it, like you, you drag and drop uh, functions, uh, if else, um, loops, and so on. Um, so that's a good way to get uh, your, the way you think, to tune the way you think, uh, uh, so that you can do uh, apply the algorithmic, algorithmic or computational thinking. Um, other than that, um, 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 go through um, resources. Um, so um, there are a lot of uh, publicly available resources, uh, mostly on YouTube. Uh, there's a lot on YouTube as well. Um, so bioinformaticians are mainly from, I can say, from India, from Ember, EBI themselves. Uh, so they have uh, these uh, workshops and lectures and so on. Uh, that teaches you uh, to do some of these uh, bioinformatics analysis. Um, I guess that's my main two to advice. All right. Yeah. Okay. Moving on from Dr. Go's question just now, maybe <laughs> what would be the challenges to apply bioinformatics when we have background in IT? In IT, yeah. yeah right. Um, so people, yeah, they have and they have bachelors in IT, but they want to do bioinformatics. Um, the main problem is basically the, the, the biological language itself. Um, so we, uh, in biology, we have the central dogma of biology. Um, so we know what are genes, we know what are proteins, yes. we know what are pathways and so on. <clears throat> uh, uh, and um, the ones who have background in IT uh, needs to understand these words first in the first place. Uh, so that's the main hurdle. Uh, but uh, they are very good. Uh, they are really very good in terms of the uh, analysis, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yes. they, uh, they know how to install these complicated tools, uh, how to run programs and so on. So um, you just need to understand uh, the language. Uh, uh, but um, depends as well. Uh, if some students have no biology background, so they didn't do biology even during their school days. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a bigger hurdle. Uh, but in terms of running the analysis, in terms of figuring out the, the, the softwares and so on, shouldn't be much a, a problem. Um, yeah, All right. Yeah. 
Of course. All right. Uh, so we have more questions from the chat box from Dr. Muni. Uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. May I know, is it expensive to run a system biology research project? And also, what are the costs that need to be considered to start off? Um, so firstly, it depends on what, what kind of project you want to do. Um, so if you are interested in um, human data set, um, so in the NCBI, there, there are a lot of human, human uh, um, transcriptome, for example. So there are already a few millions uh, there. Uh, so for in that case, the only cost that you need to uh, spend or throughout your project uh, is either the software as well as the computational facilities. Uh, so in terms of the computational facilities, there, there's a few options. Uh, uh, so either you use the cloud. Uh, so now uh, Google, Microsoft, uh, Amazon have a uh, um, uh, big servers that you can basically rent out. Uh, even as uh, in Amazon case, you uh, can rent them based on minutes, I think. So you just pay what you use. Uh, that's one of the uh, solution for uh, your computational resources. Uh, there's also um, publicly available analysis tools. Uh, the one that uh, we at Embassies uh, use a lot is the Galaxy. Uh, being run. Um, so Galaxy is a graphical user interface for bioinformatic tools uh, that are web-based. Um, so you can either install it in your own computer. Um, so instead of doing the command line things, uh, you can do your uh, normal uh, uh, click and drop. Uh, but there are also uh, free servers. Uh, so they have a Galaxy United States, Galaxy Europe, as well as Galaxy Australia. Um, so that's free, uh, but if you want more performance or more computational, you have to go for the paid version uh, because the, the the free ones are quite are quite limited. So in terms of uh, computational power is around a laptop. Uh, so the the, the the instance that they give you is uh, similar performance uh, compared to a, a laptop. Um, and lastly, you can basically build your own uh, workstations or servers or, or desktops or whatever you call it. Lah. Um, so here at Embassies, we took that option uh, because uh, although it's expensive initially, um, so a good uh, computer for doing uh, single species uh, omics analysis uh, will cost you around I can say around 10,000 ringgit. Uh, but if you want to, for example, rent out um, a cloud instance uh, with the same specification or same computational power, um, I think it's around uh, for a similar specification. Uh, I can I, I got a quotation previously for 20,000 just for one month. Uh, so basically, after two weeks, you already covered your cost of uh, obtaining your own uh, workstation. <laughs> Uh, but the cloud has advantages. Uh, you can basically scale out to infinity lah, uh, if you need to, for example, process uh, 10,000 genomes or whatever. Uh, so uh, those are not possible on a single machine. Um, so software, uh, if you use open source, there's, there's no cost. Uh, data set, you can get a free data set, uh, publicly available data sets. Um, uh, AlphaFold database or NCBI database. Uh, so mainly the costs are basically uh, your, your computational facility. Uh, either you rent out uh, cloud services or you uh, get your own machines. Uh, so that's the main the main cost. Lah. I would say around maybe 10, 20,000 per, per, per small project, lah, for a small omics project. Uh, and that's not including all the, uh, uh, all the students uh, Pay, of course lah. Um, so I hope that helps. Uh. Okay. Uh, all right. So we have another questions from Dr. Go. Uh, what are the challenges of bioinformatics research in Malaysia? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I would say my main challenge um, would be the IT support. 
<laughs> so where I studied uh, last time in Australia, um, uh, a fermentation only needs to think about the analysis. So they don't need to think about the computational facilities. They need, don't need to think about the tools, how to install the tools, how to set up and, and so on. Um, so unfortunately, in uh, at least in my case, uh, I don't have a IT support behind me, uh, behind our, 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 our bioinformatics lab. Uh, so um, I play a dual role. Um, so I'm the bioinformatician. I also am the ones who configure the servers, um, install the tools, um, reinstall the tools if um, some of the tools gets broken or gets damaged uh, from corruption and so on. Um, and lastly, the main challenge I would say um, as bioinformaticians in Malaysia, we uh, our numbers are not that much. Uh, because uh, bioinformatics itself is a big field. Um, so in bioinformatics, there's uh, people who focuses on genomics, people who focuses on transcriptomics, people who focus on pathway, people who focus on uh, molecular dynamics, uh, dockings, uh, and so on. So usually, um, for example, in uh, A-Star Singapore, uh, there's 200 bioinformaticians there. Um, so each of them are very, very expert in one thing. For example, one, one, one bioinformatician only does um, uh, protein domain. Another bioinformatician only does uh, the folding of a protein, for example. Another one who focuses on maybe um, differentially expressed genes and so on. So, on. so they have focus so they can get very expert uh, in, in, in that specific uh, application of bioinformatics. Mm. So that's uh, hence why the talk today. I hope uh, more more people are interested in bioinformatics, um, so we can have uh, more numbers here in Malaysia, uh, especially uh, since um, systems biology projects are more affordable nowadays. Uh, so a lot of people wants to do sequencing, a lot of people wants to do proteomics and so on. Uh, but who are going to analyze those data? Yes, yeah. of course. And there was like in terms of the bioinformatics research in Malaysia, right? As compared to others, mm -hmm. uh, based on your opinion, uh, how can we be compared with our neighboring countries regarding the bioinformatics industry? Um, I would say we are a bit behind, uh, uh, just based on uh, our numbers. Uh, that's uh, one 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 aspect. Uh, maybe another aspect would be. Um, our computing facilities. Um, so the national supercomputer in Singapore uh, also have uh, bioinformatics software inside uh, their system. Um, so here in Malaysia, uh, it's, it's usually um, only being assessed by that specific entity, right? Uh, so it's not it's not a national level or a national facility where uh, anyone can uh, have access uh, to that kind of system. Um, yeah, so that's the two two aspects. Maybe another one in terms of uh, funding, but uh, that one uh, applies to all all research areas, right? Not just uh, bioinformatics. <laughs> yeah, of course, it is affecting us all, right? <laughs> all right. So we are having a, a question from Prof Nazalan. His question is: Any Bacillus thuringiensis strain that are entomocidal or larvicidal to the backworms? UKM had a stock of many BT strains. Um, so I, I haven't got involved into the BT studies yet. Um, so I'm not sure Prof. Uh, Prof. Nazalan. Uh, so thank you for the question. But what, but, but we are working uh, with MPOB in, in order to progress that. Uh, so basically one of the BT um, products uh, that have been developed by MPOB. Uh, so they themselves uh, needs to optimize that further lah, uh, in terms of the production of the toxins, in terms uh, and so on, uh, strain development and so on. Uh, so let's 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 discuss on that. Uh, from that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Another question from Yash. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation, Doctor. Uh, is there any tools to classify chemical compounds which you can suggest? Thank you very much. Uh, I haven't done any chemical compound analysis yet. 
uh, maybe Dr. K. Alan eh, is a better person to uh, answer that. Uh, but uh, I'm sure they are. Lah. I'm sure there are tools uh, that are available uh, because uh, CAN informatics itself is a big field uh, where um, people who are involved in drug development uh, to find uh, all these uh, formulation of things and so on. So they have the, the pub CAN database. Yeah. They have the, the various compound databases. Uh, so I'm sure there are tools that can do that. I'm not, I'm not sure what. <laughs> so um, I think uh, maybe you, um, we can uh, have a look into that. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, PubChem and also from EBI can be mm. right. Uh, so you can refer to the, uh, to the freely available resources that usually have from the internet. <laughs> All right, another question from uh, Muhammad Fairuz. Uh, apart from the IT or informatics part in bioinformatics, what is your point of view on the mathematics part, for example, on the algorithm used in the software or the statistical component? Okay, um, so good uh, question. Um, so in terms of uh, that, um, that's... Uh, um, we have a, a, a lacking of that lah. Um, so uh, yes, correct. Uh, we need uh, mathematicians, uh, physicians, uh, as well as uh, software engineers to develop new uh, bioinformatic bio tools uh, that does uh, solve specific analysis of problems. Um, so I myself, as a, my my background doesn't doesn't is was not that way. So uh, I know how to use the tools. I know how to modify them, but I cannot develop from scratch. Uh, that's my <coughs> main limitation. Lah. Uh, but I'm really look, looking forward lah, to those uh, who does uh, mathematics or engineering or software engineering um, to collaborate because we do have some, some, some things that we would like to develop, right? Uh, so I just gave an example of the machine learning models uh, that uh, we have our, our data. We have the data. But we are not sure how to um, apply the machine learning uh, pipeline, for example, right? Um, because the current uh, available um, pipelines are more suited towards images. Uh, they are more suited towards uh, language language processing. Uh, they are more suited uh, for videos. Um, so biological data looks a bit different. Uh, for example, sequences data are just um, characters of the amino acid sequence, characters of the nucleotides. Uh, so they are not the same as languages. With languages, we have words, we have sentences, uh, we have um, meaning uh, towards the words, right? Uh, compared to sequences, we cannot, we can only um, um, uh, voice out the, the, the characters of the amino acids, but we cannot like read it, right? Um, so that's the main problem where we want to apply um, um, advanced uh, mathematics or advanced um, machine learning uh, methods uh, towards uh, biological data. Um, yes, I agree. Uh, we don't have enough people on that as well. Uh, and we need uh, more people to, to, work, to work on that. Lah. Uh, since we have, um, for example, the, the case of for Alpha 4, right? Uh, so it's a whole company who focuses on that problem. Uh, that's why they manage uh, to get um, that pipeline or that, that software out. Uh, so it was a large number of people. I think a few hundred people uh, was, was, was involved in that, uh, that, that company, a deep mind company. All right, thank you for the question. <clears throat> right, okay. We have uh, another one from Dr. Go. Uh, how would you envision the field of bioinformatics to progress in the next 10 years? <clears throat> Um, I would say uh, bioinformatics need, needs to embrace uh, machine learning as well as accelerated computing. Um, so uh, those two are actually different things. So uh, machine learning uh, basically is a, nowadays um, the state of the art is called a transformer model. So a transformer model uh, is basically a black box. So you just fit in your data set and it does a prediction of the another data set uh, that you apply it towards it. So compared to previous machine learning uh, applications where you, know, you need to do optimization, you need to do parameter uh, uh, setting and so on. So nowadays uh, that's not needed anymore. Lah. 
Um, so why that's machine learning? Um, also, we need to uh, uh, embrace accelerated uh, computing. Um, so one of examples I would say uh, the Oxford Nanopore. Uh, so the Oxford Nanopore is basically a sequencing machine, right? So it's a big as a, a thumb drive where you can you can connect to a laptop. Uh, but the software itself, uh, that does the base calling, uh, is uh, very fast because it utilizes the, the graphical processing unit of a computer. Um, so anything that uh, being offloaded from the CPU, the our uh, processor inside a computer, uh, can be called as, as accelerated computing. Lah. So either you use uh, GPUs or you use um, FPGAs. Uh, so these are specific hardware that can accelerate. Um, certain uh, computational or ma mathematical calculation. Um, so, uh, in terms of the software, um, I only know Gromax that does accelerated computing. Uh, so, the other tools, for example, uh, tools for assembly, tools for uh, homology searching, tools for uh, doing phylogenetics, and so on, they are still uh, depending on. Uh, the processor of a computer. So um, in terms of that, um, the reduction of the analysis uh, is not that fast. Lah. Um, for example, in Gromax uh, use case, um, just by offloading our calculation towards the GPU, we can get, um, um, I think, 30x speed up, um, 30 times faster, uh, just by offloading some of the calculations. Uh, towards uh, a GPU. So we have the graphical processing unit as well as the processor working together lah, to solve the problem uh, in molecular dynamics. Uh, but uh, we need more people, especially in um, software engineering background and so on, to port the other tools um, into the accelerated uh, computing uh, platform. Lah. So the, the API is there. Uh, basically, the, the most used one is the CUDA API. Uh, by NVIDIA, uh, but the tools doesn't utilize that API, so that's the main problem. Lah. Mm. Right. That's my view. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> All right. We have uh, a couple of more uh, questions from Hassan. Uh, his question, uh, what are the challenges in bioinformatics for statistical data mining? And also any advice for critical issues in bioinformatics and data computing? <clears throat> okay, um, first I comment on the statistics. Um, so the challenge with statistics, so I, I'm not a biostatistician, uh, but uh, some of the problems in uh, biostatistics is basically uh, the, just the number of samples. Um, so, um, for example, um, the human genome, right? Um, so we have uh, how many thousand genes? I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, at least I think 30,000 or something like that. Um, uh, and for, for, for example, if you want to develop a new drugs, right? Um, so which gene are involved for a, a specific disease? Uh, so basically we need to have the genome, um, the, the whole genome sequence uh, of, of everyone that has the disease lah, in order to uh, identify that, right? But just the, the problem of uh, there are so many genes compared to the number of samples. Uh, so in terms of statistics, it's, it's a problem. Lah. Uh, so that's why uh, I think one of the main initiatives now for finding new drugs uh, is being uh, led by AstraZeneca. Uh, so they are collecting um, a whole genome uh, data from I think 2 million people or something like that. 2, 2 million people uh, in order to find new drugs, right? Um, so that one is mainly to overcome the issue of uh, statistics, uh, statistical problem. Uh, to really uh, uh, zoom in into which uh, genes or which uh, pathways uh, that are specific uh, to a disease. Um, what was the other question? <laughs> Another one is critical issues in bioinformatics and data computing. Um, Any advice on that? Critical issues. Yeah. Uh, I think I've uh, highlighted uh, most, most of it already. Um, so uh, in terms maybe in terms of the software support, uh, 
focus on the facilities. So um, in my view, we need a national level facility like, at least. Uh, uh, so we have one for meteorology, right? So our weather prediction, so they have a data center for that. Uh, but where's the data, data center for um, biotech or biotechnology, right? Yes. Uh, um, so <coughs> now, now they are very um, uh, entity specific. Uh, so company A has their own uh, bioinformatics facilities. Company B has their own bioinformatics analysis. Uh, but I like the model of uh, Singapore. Uh, so there are supercomputers uh, being used by both the academics as well as the industry. So the industry themselves, they don't have their own uh, supercomputer uh, as, as far as I know. Uh, um, so they share resources uh, and uh, they share the cost as well. Um, so uh, because they, they see the benefit where the, the, the government um, uh, provides the infrastructure um, so from the infrastructure, they found new materials, they found new drugs, or they found new um, uh, knowledge uh, that leads to a new product uh, being developed in the country and that uh, gains, uh, get, get fit into the economy, right? Uh, so in terms of the yeah. tax and so on, right? Um, so they, 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 they see that bigger picture. Lah. So um, that's uh, my, my, my hope lah, for, for Malaysia. So we need, we need to work on that. Uh, so let's not uh, be down on it. We need to work on that. Uh, give suggestions uh, to the, the 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 government and so on, and and help uh, the government in order to make this uh, come true. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Next, uh, from Puan Intan, do you have any tips in writing a good bioinformatics research paper or journal? <clears throat> okay. Um. So in terms of uh, purely bioinformatics paper. Uh, so, uh, meaning that um, uh, papers that uh, without any uh, validation or wet lab validation, right? Uh, so, I, I guess that's the question. Um, so, you need to figure out um, niche things. Lah. Um, so, um, papers that only rely on a output of a single bioinformatic tools are usually not sufficient for publication because basically anyone can do it. Um, so anyone can take that specific tool, can take uh, their own data set and produce the results, right? Um, so by any claims, uh, that that's, that gets easy nowadays. Lah. Um, so just like um, genome papers. So last, during the early genomic areas, uh, any genomes you can publish, right? Uh, but nowadays you need to validate your genome, you need to uh, figure out whether the genes are really present or not, whether the proteins are, are there and so on, right? So you need some kind of validation. So um, as a advice, I would say, uh, try to focus on that lah, um, niche uh, problems that can only be solved uh, computationally, right? Um, for, for example, um, I think that I can highlight alpha full. <laughs> so <laughs> compared to the crystal structures, there's only 190,000 uh, protein structures, uh, but now they have computationally generated to 200 million, right? Uh, so they solve the problem by uh, implementing machine learning. So they develop their own um, tools or pipeline. Lah. Uh, so they don't depend on any other um, uh, existing tools. Uh, because uh, they they want to get a better version of that analysis, right? Um, so if developing a totally new tool is uh, a, a too big hurdle to to just to get a single paper, or right? uh, focus on um, combination or or combination of analysis. Um, basically, you develop your own pipeline, right? A series of analysis, uh, just like I showed just now, um, where we utilize multiple tools uh, in order to answer a specific uh, single questions. Uh, so that kind of uh, work uh, should be okay uh, for publication. <clears throat> yes, I agree with you, Azlan. Most of the journals nowadays will ask for validation from our bioinformatics findings. However, for a full bioinformatics uh, paper, perhaps you need to have a comprehensive discussion in terms of the novelty that you have from your experiments. And you need also need to refer to a lot of research articles to prove, to prove your findings from there. So maybe you can start from there as well. So we also have a question from Facebook, is it? Uh, may I know, does bioinformatics analysis always need to be validated 
ni macam nak jawab tak with wet lab or does it have its own way for validation of the analysis uh, so if you cannot do wet lab validation uh, so one of the ways we validate is by doing comparative work right uh, for example we identify a new a, a pathway in uh, our our insect for example so we can look into either neighboring insects uh, they are very near taxonomically uh, and compare the pathway. So that's one, one way of doing it. Lah. Um, so another way, um, maybe the strategy of uh, like in data science where you have a data set that you analyze on, but you also have another data set where you uh, just to validate whether the things that you find, but that is not included in your analysis in the first place. Right. Um, so. Um, so in, in, in data science, they do validation like that. So let's say they have uh, 100 data set, right? So they only work on the 80 sample first. They keep the 20 for the validation part. Um, so that's computational val validation is possible. Yeah. Lah, but but uh, of course, the best is uh, well that validation. Yeah. As for uh, the bioinformatics, analysis you can also add some uh, molecular molecular dynamics and simulation as well to confirm the function of your uh, your candidates your proteins to infer whether it is it have the same uh, functions or not right Tazlan? <coughs> yep that's correct uh, uh, another one from uh, Chi Fonting uh, how to judge if certain bioinformatics results say annotation is valid in terms of statistics or is there any related common standard for bioinformatician to refer on? Um, so this is a specific um, field of bio biostatistics. Lah. Um, so it depends on uh, the field. Um, so I think for example, uh, metabolomics, I think they, have, they need around 40 samples, I think. Um, so it's very... Uh, domain or or, or or field specific lah in terms of the number of samples or, or to get a, um, a a confident enough statistic uh, statistical results lah. Uh, but all the um, normal uh, statistical um, analysis uh, can, can can be done lah, like all the t-tests and whatever all the correlation and so on right um, so we usually just apply the uh, being the ones being used by um, the statistics field as well. Uh, but we have challenged uh, in, in the cases where we don't have enough samples and so on. Um, so in, um, I think the 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 uh, omics field that are very closely related to this statistic to me is metabolomics. So they have all the PCA plots and so on, right? Um, so uh, we I, uh, can refer to, to those who, who does that. Lah. Uh, I myself, I don't focus on statistics much because uh, I try to focus on the uh, processing, right? Uh, in terms of that, like for example, for genome, right? Genome project, they don't have um, any statistics inside that uh, unless you go downstream right, later, right? Uh, so I, I hope uh, that gives you an, an idea where, where to look for answers. Uh, I don't have uh, specific answers at the moment. Thank you, Fonting. Okay, uh, perhaps this is the last question for me. <laughs> All right. Uh, what would be your biggest challenge in applying this bioinformatics study in translational biotechnology? Um... Personally, the biggest challenge is because bioinformatics, this, this level of bioinformatics are mostly fundamental work, right? Uh, fun, fundamental sciences um, where we analyze uh, biological data and it's very far from the, the, the product side right, and the end products. Um, so uh, just to justify your project or, or just to uh, convey your idea, uh, that's, that was a big, big challenge. Huh? Uh, uh, but uh, as we interact with uh, to those who do the other fields, right? Um, so we we get we get uh, we, we we have an idea lah how we can help uh, those people. Uh, so 
I guess that highlights one of the main, um, uh, I would say, disadvantages of being a bioinformatician. Bio so, so um, we, 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 we analyze data, right? We analyze data. So it, we are quite far from product, uh, products or whatever or commission, you know, unless we do services, uh, <laughs> right? Um, so um, to me, um, uh, we need to educate people uh, to basically differentiate that, differentiate that right? Um, so if everybody is working on the products, who we work on the data analysis, right? So uh, I think that's one of the reasons <laughs> not not many doing bioinformatics. Um, so uh, we need to educate people and hopefully um, we have more people who can, because the data gets um, uh, very, very large uh, daily, right? So there's always a new sequencing data, a new uh, structure data. So just Alpha4 itself have released 200 million uh, structures. So who wants to go through that? Right? Who wants to find new uh, biological discovery from that? Uh, if everybody focuses on the commercial part, right? And that's my, my view, uh, <laughs> my stand. Yeah, of course. <laughs> May, perhaps we have one final question from Dr. Go. Uh, how's the job market for bioinformatics graduates in Malaysia? Yeah, this is very important too. Uh, so I don't have uh, exact numbers, uh, but my view is uh, um, especially the, the ones who are involved in uh, biology, for example, um, uh, MARDI, MPOB, uh, entities, uh, they, are, they, are, they are government entities, uh, but they deal with biological data. So I found that uh, these places, at least lah, at these places, uh, don't have enough uh, bioinformaticians. Uh, IMR, uh, I have a recent uh, query from uh, FRIM, uh, the forest, uh, I forgot what's the, who, who, who caters the forest, right? Mm -hmm. um, so they need somebody to develop their uh, database, uh, their software um, to handle all the barcoding of the trees and so on. Uh, they don't have any in-house uh, person to do that. Uh, so to me, um, there are places who really need uh, more bioinformaticians. Um, so uh, I just hope that uh, the graduates or the people who does uh, bioinformatics are proactive enough to approach these people uh, to get involved. Uh, but in terms of uh, industry, uh, I think it's a challenge uh, because uh, they depend on uh, projects, uh, uh, basically funded projects uh, uh, to do bioinformatics, right? Um, so even uh, bioinformatics focused company in Malaysia, they have clients from overseas because they just cannot sustain uh, based on the projects being funded in Malaysia alone. Um, other than that, I maybe startups or something, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I believe there are places who need uh, bioinformatics. Uh, I'm just not sure uh, how many positions are available, what are the, 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 the nitty gritty details on the positions available yet uh, at the moment. Right, good, good point, Dr. Go. Uh, so it was, it, it is a concern to us uh, as uh, academics who trains uh, new bioinformaticians every year, right? Um, so we are, we are worried. Uh, in the end, they don't get uh, bioinformatics related jobs uh, and focus on IT jobs and so on. Uh, <laughs> it's common. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need to think about that, right? And then the cost of investigating these inquiries will enhance our interest and develop our skill in the informatics part, right? Okay. And 
Uh, okay, Dr. Goh have another question here. Uh, how about implementation compared to the data scientist in terms of job market competitiveness? Uh, okay. Um, so as far as I know, uh, the data science uh, field uh, is very, they, they don't have enough people at the moment. Lah. Uh, they don't have enough people at the moment. So uh, nowadays, uh, companies are basically um, trying to analyze their own data. Uh, maybe I can give an example uh, for Petronas. So Petronas uh, themselves have created a company. Uh, I forgot the name, I think Petronas Digital or something like that. Um, so they created a company just to do data science in Petronas alone. Um, because they see uh, the importance of uh, analyzing uh, this data. So the, the numbers uh, needed for data scientists uh, are, 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 are needed by the industry at the moment. Uh, but uh, the main problem is the key skills uh, that are needed uh, to fill in those jobs. Um, so basically you need to be very good in Python. Uh, you need to also be very good uh, in uh, all the um, data science pipeline. So they have SQL, they have, uh, I think for visualization, they have Power BI, uh, things like that. Lah. Um, so they don't develop software, but uh, data scientists uh, programs uh, to analyze their data sets. Lah. Uh, and their data sets are much, much bigger than uh, biology actually. So, but their parameters are lower. Uh, uh, so I have one previous student who analyzes uh, the 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 toll the toll entry. So every time people go through a toll, they have a, a, a check in time and so on, right? Um, so they want to detect. I think the company wants to detect. Uh, I think for really you know, people who skip skip the toll uh, basically like that. Um, so they have millions of uh, samples. Uh, but only a few hundred parameters uh, compared to biology. We have thousands of parameters, uh, we have thousands of genes, thousands of proteins, uh, but uh, samples are maybe 10 samples and so on, right? So the, the challenge is uh, different, uh, different. So although it's data science, uh, but the way we, uh, the problem that we face are uh, quite, quite a bit different. Um, so you need to um, reskill uh, as a bioinformatics, uh, to those bioinformatic graduates uh, who wants to go into data science needs needs to reskill a bit, uh, especially in terms of the um, uh, Python and so on, uh, data data science uh, applications or and pipelines. But in terms of the thinking, I think no no problem uh, because we uh, bioinformaticians are already uh, have the computational thinking uh, part uh, sector, just to need to uh, top up the skills. Hopefully that helps answer Dr. Go. Yeah, Please. actually, uh, I have a couple of students doing internship uh, at Top Love. They are in di data scientist program and of course they do not solve the biological data sets, right? But they are trying to solve the management problems, the data storing that they have in Top Love and so on. So if they have uh, interest, maybe they can venture into that uh, other uh, industrial as well. Yeah, but but some 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 industry players comment that data scientists only needed maybe for the next ten or twenty years because mm -hmm. after that everything, all the data science will be done by machine learning. So <laughs> so, so, once, machine learning. Uh, so <laughs> once that period is achieved, so the data scientists are not needed anymore lah. But at the moment, because the machine learning tools are not developed yet, so mm -hmm. they are developing it. Uh, so since now we need to do manual manual data science, right? Um, yeah. Raw data science. That's why a lot of people is needed like, at the moment. Maybe mm -hmm. the next five years or next ten years. Mm 